I often wonder when you do when we do these reports if anyone's really listening to them. So I'm just gonna instead of having to do a report, um, I look at this these topics and they're, they're, they provoke a lot of people like myself to be really upset and I, I don't want to provoke anybody. I, I want to look at what we're doing today in America instead of doing the reports that I know in the past have not been very useful or helpful but they do matter in the past with our previous reports. <clears throat> but finally what you're seeing today is that when you swear an oath in the military that you're actually your voice is actually being heard for the first time whereas in my case it wasn't like that in my case when I served at when I signed up I had no idea what I was signing up for and they even told me that <laughs> they didn't know what we were signing ourselves up for <laughs> we weren't sure either I was handicapped and crippled, and I couldn't even get my two one file. I couldn't even get a PT. I couldn't even get a PT appointment. So for somebody like right, me, I would have ended up homeless and nowhere to go. Instead, I have to go home, and after I served my country, I got kicked out on the street with nowhere to go at 19. It doesn't make for somebody to who have served honorably feel very honorable. And it was one dishonor after another. And to get my 2-1 file after 27 years, after constant ridicule and, and attacks, and they're arguing about immigration. We couldn't even get our 2-1 file. It took 27 years to get that just to even know if I had a service-connected injury. And I laid there paralyzed. I didn't have any extra PT appointments. I could barely walk. I didn't even know how to put a sentence together. I went from being a fully functional 19-year-old woman serving my country to completely incapacitated. There was no special appointments for me. There was no special, you know, people running around helping me in a wheelchair. There was nothing like that. There was no one going out of their way to help us take us out to dinner or do anything. No, I laid in a hospital bed and then in my, my dad's apartment with no AC crawling everywhere. So when I see how many things are being done today, I am so happy to hear that. But it, still, you can li look at what's going on in Congress. You look at what's going on today in an immigration debate. Some of us are still barely able to survive our injuries. It's a disgrace what has happened to our, to what has been done to our veterans. It's a disgrace and no one should ever settle for it, ever. They don't even know what happened at Operation Desert Storm. Some people don't even know their military history, to be honest with you. They don't even know what happened on Operation Desert Storm. What was that? Operation Desert Storm? They don't even know if it even happened. We're not quite sure. We don't remember that day. But we do. We who served that day when I was sitting in, in rotation... on graduation day actually when they were giving out the orders to go I was watching my friends that I was training with getting their orders to go to the next mission. I was going home because I was on the split option program. 
and their faces went from joy because it was graduation day to complete utter just they went totally blank they knew that they were going to probably serve at whatever capacity and they were probably going to go be shipped out right after that to Kuwait and there was a lot of people who felt like yeah, about the missions that went into Kuwait and into all through this experience Many people were shook at night, went to bed trembling, wondering what was going to happen, on what mission you were going to go on. And that was many of us for, oh, I'd say since I was 19. <clears throat> we shook at night. And then people said you had an anxiety issue. I go, <laughs> we have an anxiety problem. You don't know if you're going to die. You don't know if you're going to live. You don't know what's going to happen. So if we had a little bit of a nightmare or two, <laughs> so we had a few nightmares <laughs> and done some, but we all knew the danger we were going to face in America because we felt it. We knew it. And we, many of us lived through it, lived it, experienced the night terrors, the night. Ex We weren't fighting a, a war on terrorism. We were fighting something so bigger and different than that. I went to bed at night after watching reports of Al Zarqawi, and it was in June 2003 to June 2006. We never even heard of what a beheading was. We never, we didn't even hear about something like that. But in the Middle East, that was norm, the norm. So to say the least, whenever I, they finally sent my tier one file after 27 years of bureaucratic red tape, which we really appreciate that because I talked to the commander, we were in what they call no man's land. You don't know if you're really a, you don't know if you're a veteran, you don't know anything. You just, for the last 20 some years, we didn't know what we were. We knew we served, okay, we knew that much, but that's about it, that's about it, okay. As far as the bureaucratic red tape, if you ask any person that worked on my case, this was normal. This was the norm. <laughs> this was actually normal. 27 years, and here I am. I've gone to that same commander every time. I'm like, I just I don't know if you found anything out about my 215. Because no, we didn't. But that was normal, okay? I just want to remember, I want to remember this moment because I hope those days have changed since we elected a person that actually cares about our military and veterans. Other than the other reports, I'm going to have to save it for later. I'm going to leave it there. God bless you.